Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has us looking up at a giant coneflower. OSU consumer horticulture specialist David Hillock strikes gold with a new watermelon that Barbara Brown uses to create a sweet and savory side dish. In Cole County, Oklahoma, we visit the Choctaw Nation Demonstration Garden, uncover a tough heirloom squash, and stop by the Clarity Nursery for some mums. And finally, back in Stillwater, OSU turfgrass specialist Dennis Martin shows us a trial that tests the drought tolerance of Bermuda grass varieties. We've got another native Oklahoma proven plant we want to introduce you to and this one is called Rudbeckia maxima and I think you can see how it got its common name giant coneflower as it gets to be a height of about five to six feet tall with these gorgeous yellow and of course black heads on them. This native is more often seen on the eastern side of the state but can be well established in any garden in Oklahoma as it's hardy from zones four to eight. Now it'll start out with some lower basal growth but through this spring and into early summer it's going to shoot up with these giant flowers as it blooms in early summertime. You can deadhead these flowers back to get a second flush that will come on. When it's not blooming it has a lovely blue green foliage that it adds to the garden as well as the vertical element that it establishes in your landscape design. For best effect you're going to want to plant this perennial in a mass. Throughout the year, we've highlighted several of the All-America Selection winners that we have in our display garden this year. Uh, one that we'd like to show you today is the Gold in Gold Watermelon. We're really impressed with this plant. It's a nice, vigorous grower, high yielding. Um, it's an early maturing variety, um, but it's a beautiful watermelon. See, it's, a, it's actually yellow skinned with orange stripes, and then the inside is a really nice uh, yellow gold flesh as well. It's supposed to be high sugar content, so nice and sweet. It's uh, disease resistant and is also resistant to cracking and splitting. Well, we've been watching these. This one looks really good. Uh, I think we should open this one up and take a look at it and taste it and see how it is. Oh wow, look at the inside of that. Nice and yellow, golden color. Split that open. <laughs> mm. This is really nice and sweet. This will be great in a recipe. Everybody has a favorite way to eat watermelon. So today, I'm not going to try to discourage you from that one. I'm going to increase your uh, repertoire, so to speak, uh, of what's available. What we're going to do is a tomato and watermelon salad. And I'm using those great yellow watermelons from the garden. Uh, but you could use red ones if you don't have the yellow. You could use, I'm using red tomatoes to give it some color contrast. You can use yellow. You can mix and match the colors, mix and match flavors. Uh, but this is what we're going to do. So I've got two tomatoes. Uh, large ones that I've just cut into 
to six pieces uh, each, or six slices, and I've spread them out on a platter. If you wanted to serve them on individual dishes, just put three on each of the, of the salad plates that you've got. And then I'm gonna make a little bit of a dressing. I've got four cups of, of melon that I have cut into bite-sized pieces. You don't wanna make it too small or the juice is gonna come out on you. Uh, so leave them fairly large. Uh, I tried to de-seed it, but there's still some hidden seeds there. And that just makes part of the eating experience with watermelon. Uh, the dressing, I've got two tablespoons of white balsamic vinegar and a tablespoon of olive oil a fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt, and a fourth of a teaspoon of ground pepper. We're just gonna stir these together well. You could try and, and uh, whisk them together if you want to, but uh, there's nothing really in here that's gonna keep an emulsion in place. And these flavors are fine if you actually just wanted to sprinkle the salt and pepper over everything and, and uh, drizzle the vinegar and the oil over as well. So this is gonna go over our melon. One of the nice things about yellow melon, it is, is sweeter than red melon uh, if you get equally ripe melons in both colors. The yellow one should be a little bit sweeter. The downside is, is that it doesn't have the lycopene because the lycopene is a red or pink pigment. And so you're gonna find that in the red melons, but not so much, you'll, there'll be some, but not very much in the yellow melon. So there is that difference between the two. Also in here, I'm gonna put in uh, about oh, three or four leaves that we've cut uh, fairly finely of basil. And stir this whole thing together. It doesn't have to sit very long. In fact, you wouldn't want it to sit very long because again, you're gonna lose the juice from it. The red melon also has a little bit more uh, vitamin C than the yellow melon does. So there is a difference between the two, uh, but because we get so much of our lycopene from tomato products, probably 80 to 90 percent depending on the person, uh, the amount uh, that you're missing from eating a yellow melon is definitely not something you want to worry about. Choosing a food simply because you want to get more of a particular one nutrient is generally not the best way to approach uh, the diet. All right, there you go. This one's ready to go. I'm gonna put a little bit of basil on top of it just for decoration. It's a watermelon and tomato salad. I hope you'll give it a try. It's really good, especially with these great yellow melons. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Good morning. Uh, we're here at, at, uh, at Lehigh, Oklahoma, which is just south of Colgate. Uh, we're at the Choctaw Demonstration uh, Garden and Community Center. Uh, and, and I have, uh, I'm visiting today with, with Mr. Jeffrey Roebuck, who is the, uh, who kind of manages and, and uh, oversees this facility here. So, good morning, Jeffrey. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Well, we've uh, been an uh, interesting summer here. We, we've uh, initiated a pretty sizable uh, uh, demonstration planting with a number of different crops. We, uh, we have tomatoes, we have several types of squash, we've got eggplants and peppers and all. Tell us a little bit about the reason why the Choctaw Nation is interested in doing this sort of thing. Well, one thing with the, with the Choctaw Nation, we like to promote healthier, healthier living. And, uh, uh, and one thing we've kind of, kind of grown pa apart from is, is gardening. And right. with this mm -hmm. with this demonstration center, we want to try to to teach people that you don't need a hundred acres or ten acres. That there's able ways that you can do gardening, uh, whether it's feed trough gardening, aquaponics gardening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one thing that that you brought to to our attention is the the plastic mulch, and you know we just want to demonstrate that there's all types of different gardening that that you can do nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when you drive by on the highway here, and this is, this is a pretty, uh, you don't see many large vegetable plantings this size down in this part of the, of the state and all. And it's really hasn't been, uh, it really hasn't been a tremendous amount of labor. You know, nobody's, nobody's really working full time here. Uh, several people have, we've come by, uh, myself and some of my uh, co-workers have come by and, and helped out a little bit with the planting and all. But 
like you said, this, this plastic mulch and we have drip irrigation installed also. And that just makes it a, a whole, whole lot easier to, uh, to grow, grow vegetables and, and, and get better quality and keep things like the weeds under control yeah. and, and, and the diseases and all. So. Yes, sir. And uh, this, this spring we've had a, a considerable amount of rainfall. And by using the, the plastic mulch, I believe it has kind of let shed off the water a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think if we had not used that, and we also have raised beds here, I think had we not done that, we wouldn't have any tomatoes here. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. So, just uh, these, these uh, tomatoes, just to talk a little bit about what we're doing with the tomatoes, we actually have, uh, uh, we have uh, two different varieties planted here. So uh, one of them is called Solar Fire. Uh, tomato and the other is red morning. The uh, the reason we chose those varieties is because some previous work done done by the OSU uh, Extension uh, Vegetable Program uh, that, that's led by Dr. Lynn Brandenberger who works out of Stillwater. But we we trialed a number of different varieties, trying to find varieties that would continue to set fruit when when we get into the hot part of the year. And these were a couple of the ones that surfaced as some of the better ones for doing that. So that's the reason we chose them, and it's kind of just a, a chance to demonstrate them and, and, and verify, you know, are they really good varieties for down in this area. And, and uh, considering we, we've had some pretty hot weather the past couple of weeks now, and the plants are continuing to flower, and we're still getting some fruit set. Uh, as you can see, we have, um, I know we've been harvesting already, and but we continue to have more fruit coming on, so I think they've, uh, I think they perform pretty well. Yes, you know, sir. Both of yes, the varieties. Sir. And what we kind of been doing with the fruit is once we harvest it, we take it up to the Choctaw Center in Colgate, and we uh, we give it out to to all the seniors. So it kind of uh, working with y'all in the Choctaw Nation, we've been able to to give uh, about a hundred pounds of vegetables away okay, just to wow. the That's, to the elderly mm -hmm. elderly mm -hmm. people up here. Okay. Okay. Good. Says so, so. It's not all. Uh, being put to good use and it's also we're learning you know yes, this, sir. This, we're definitely on a learning curve this year yes this sir is, this is pretty much the first time to plant any vegetables on this side i think isn't yes it? sir we had a kind of a small scale garden last year that mm -hmm. that we har was able to harvest a few things mm -hmm. but uh you know this is our second year in in production so uh i believe I believe sky's the limit now we also have some uh back here a little ways some eggplants and some different varieties. Why don't we walk over there a little closer and take a look at those? Well, here we have uh, we have a, a variety or or some some uh, some different varieties of eggplant. And we at another location working with the farmer uh, in nearby, we're actually doing a, a variety trial, comparing about six or seven different eggplant varieties. Uh, the reason for doing that is to egg, eggplant is not a a real popular crop in this area and it's a crop that certainly can be grown here it, uh, with our hot summer time conditions eggplant is one crop that will tolerate that heat but it's it's just not a vegetable that's used real extensively in the area uh, but anyhow we people people there are people interested in it and we're trying to find uh, doing these variety trials to try to find what varieties might be best most acceptable uh, see if it would kind of allow a farmer to diversify and Especially people growing for the farmers market, if they, if they have a variety of eggplants there, that'll that'll attract uh, the customers' attention, and, and uh, they'll uh, and, and then you know we always have people who are who in fact we often have people who say I wish I could get some eggplant but I can't find any so uh, hopefully we'll we'll provide some answers to that and and, and it could be able to come up with some recommendations or wood good varieties so we have uh, one variety there that's a white eggplant when it's mature it, it's it's white. Then we have another one uh, next to that, which is kind of a variegated, a light purple and white. And then we have one which might be considered more of the standard eggplant, which is a, a darker purple and globe-shaped uh, fruits on that. So, and as you can see, they've, uh, they've really been productive. Here, look at, we've got some nice fruit here. Nice fruit here coming on, ready, ready to be picked. Here's some others that are a little smaller, need, need a few more days. But uh, like I said, very, uh, they tolerate these hot conditions well, and, and they just, uh, and especially you give them some water and all to grow, and, and you, you, eggplant can be very productive here. So, uh, no, one thing about eggplant is you're always going to see holes in the leaves, and there are several different insects that will uh, will feed on eggplant leaves, and they really, for the most part, don't do much damage. You know, that li that little bit of uh, leaf perforation is, is really not going to interfere too much with the uh, with the production also. Uh, 
So not, bottom line is eggplants don't generally have a whole lot of, uh, of pest and disease problems to deal with that you have to be concerned about. So, Well, Jeff, I'm really pleased that we've been able to work together on this project here yes, this sir. year to, uh, to uh, learn more and, and be able to teach the, the uh, people in the area more about growing vegetables and consuming vegetables yes, sir. Uh, that, that can be grown in this area. Yes, so, sir. So. And uh, we want to thank uh, you and all, the, all your help and the Oklahoma State Extension, and, and uh, we look forward to the partnership to keep going on. Here we are at the, uh, the Lehigh uh, Demonstration Center uh, where we have a, a planting of a number of different vegetables. And one of the vegetables we included in this planting, and we have a pretty sizable area of it, is, is something called, referred to as a Choctaw squash, or also they refer to it as a sweet potato squash. This is an heirloom squash that, that has been uh, uh, kept by, by, uh, by Choctaw uh, and, Native, and other, probably other Native American farmers. And it's, uh, it's really a, uh, an interesting crop. As you can see, it's, the vines are extremely vigorous. Uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, we, the reason we made this plant such a large planting, and you see we have some covers over part of it back here, it was part of a, a study where we're looking at the use of, uh, of, uh, of row covers as a way to exclude insect pests, uh, namely the squash bug, which, which just wreaks havoc on squash plantings down in this part of the country. Here on the same location, we have some summer yellow standard uh, straight neck yellow squash and the squash bugs just they just they they, uh, they they're merciless with it they they the plants get up to where they're starting to produce and then the squash bug attack this squash doesn't seem to attract the squash bug as much for some reason we as i as i've kind of monitored them and all that i just haven't found that many squash bugs on them so uh and like i said very vigorous uh, i haven't tasted it myself yet but some people tell me that the that the fruit the squash fruit are delicious and we have some uh, some fruit coming on over here we can point them out to you i'm sure it's gonna get a little larger than that i'm not 100 percent sure exactly how large they get but but they tell me it's a delicious uh, delicious fruit with a, a little bit of flavor of sweet potato so uh, hopefully we'll be able to tell you some more about it in the future once they're ripe and, and once we harvest some so Hello, I'm Casey Russell, Cole County Ag Educator and 4-H Youth Development Educator for Cole County. And today we're at Clary to Oklahoma at the Clary to Greenhouse with Eli Schrock. Eli, how are you today? Doing good, how are you? Good. Uh, Eli, tell us a little bit about your business and then about your mums. Okay. Uh, my business is we got primarily a, a, a retail greenhouse garden center operation. In the spring we do a lot of bedding plants and stuff and so forth. But in the fall, it's primarily mums and pumpkins, pansies, stuff that you can plant in the fall. Fall vegetables, cabbage, stuff like that. And the mums are doing good this year. They're, we'd like to have another rain on them, but we're not getting it. But I'm watering them every day and they're doing good as, as a whole. Okay, how long does it take you to start these? Uh, I, I get them June, uh, May the 20th. May the 20th is the day I got them this year, so this is almost the 1st of August. It's a small seedlings. Yeah, yeah, they were like like that tall. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when will they be ready for retail? Probably, hopefully, mid-September. Okay, all right. Tell us a little bit about your irrigation system. 
Oh, it's pretty pretty simple and straightforward. It's just uh, th these black hoses and these little feeder lines, and it's got this weighted dripper in it, and and whenever I turn the water on, it just each each pot gets its own little dripper. Just waters it. it water. Takes about 45 minutes. Okay, so you water them every day. Every day, sometimes in hot weather, twice a day. Twice a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what variety are you growing? Uh, these are uh, they're Yoder mums is what they call them. Okay. Uh, used to be Yoder brothers would own them when I first started buying them, but they're I'm I'm not even sure who they're owned by now, but it's it's not Yoder brothers anymore. Right. How many colors are you growing? To... That's a hard question. Hard question. Uh, at least a dozen. A dozen mm -hmm. different colors. shades. You know, I got like three shades of orange and four shades of yellow, but. Uh, orange, yellow, purple, and pink, and white. That's okay. that's would basically cover it. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about your spring operation and your bedding plants. Uh, spring, we we start out early February, first of February, and we we'll, we sell fruit trees. February is a great time to plant fruit trees, uh, and, and potato plants and seeds. We get we cut all kinds of seeds for the garden, and then we just keep on going. Cabbage plants is the next, and and squash and tomatoes and and of course ornamentals. There's we got all kinds of ornamental trees and plants, annuals and perennials, and we just try to have about everything that you would possibly need for your garden or your flower bed. And the mo majority of those are started here oh, at yes. your greenhouse. Yes, yes, we we do buy all our woody trees and uh, and shrubs. We do buy, but uh, most of the stuff that you would plant in the garden, all the stuff that you'd plant in the garden and in the flower beds is started here. Okay. Well, Eli, we appreciate you being here today. We're in Clarita, Oklahoma at the Clarita Greenhouse. We're approximately 35 miles southeast of Ada and we encourage you to come and see them. Thank you. Today we're at the 2016 through 2019 Specialty Crops Research Initiative Drought Resistance Trials for Bermuda grass and zoysia grass here at Oklahoma State University. This Specialty Crops Research Project funded by United States Department of Agriculture is focused on developing, helping breeders develop improved drought resistance in four turf grass species. In Oklahoma it mainly focuses on Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. You can see one of the casualties of the drought resistance trial here. We turned the water off on this trial back in June and it had a number of weeks without rain, but it's only on natural rainfall. So this allows us to rule out experimental lines like the one that we see here, which is dyed largely from drought, uh, drought stress. And then also you can see a number of varieties that survived the drought and recovered quite well after we received a little bit of rainfall. It's trials like these that led to the development of some of the best drought resistant turf grasses available in the marketplace now, which includes Tiftuff, a development from the University of Georgia, and then also Tahoma 31, developed by Oklahoma State University. So trials like this allow us to weed out the germplasm that doesn't have good drought resistance and only keep and work with further those types that have outstanding drought resistance. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead.
Next week's show will be sweet and spicy. David Hillock will pick a peck of All-American Selection Peppers. Host Casey Hinches will explore honey production from the hive to the bear-shaped bottle. And Barbara Brown will infuse honey with even more garden goodness. You'll want to stick around and catch the buzz next week when we have more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.